Well, we are beginning our new series in the book of Genesis. And uh, we are this morning, we are going to be looking at just uh, three short verses. And <clears throat> what, what we're doing is, is we're going to be looking at different aspects that I'll uh, be explaining. The verses we're going to be looking at is Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 and 5. And it, it's when we look at the verses 3 and 5, we look and we see the very first words that God utters as a command. And that is, let there be light. And when we see that, it is an amazing thing because one of the things is, we, we have to understand is, is the Bible says there was light on the first day of creation. But however, the sun and moon and stars were not created until the fourth day. And so that brings us with a conundrum then, well, what is that light then that is being mentioned in Genesis chapter 1 verse 3? Well, one of the things that I do believe is that we understand that Scripture interprets Scripture, and when we look at this, the Bible and what it says about light, especially when we see in the book of Revelation, because there are many parallels between Genesis and Revelation, in the end, in the last chapters, that is an interesting part, because that is when what? When Jesus is the light of the nations, and it never goes out. And that is the, one of the interesting things that we read about that. And what we have is we have the creation of the world now in, in Genesis and the Garden of Eden. That's God's temple on earth. We also have the fall of mankind. And we have the curse on man and the rest of creation where God dwelt and communed with man. And in the book of Revelation, what do we see but the reversal of this curse? and how this takes place. Therefore, the light in Genesis 1-3 is the same light that will exist in a new heaven and a new earth in Revelation. And in Revelation 21, verse 23, it says, The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of the Lord gives its light, and the Lamb is its lamp. Well, guess what? That's the, what it, that light is in Genesis 1. It's the glory of the Lord, and we're going to be seeing that as we look through the scriptures today. But before we do that, when I talk about that parallels between Genesis and Revelation, I want to just talk about those, that. In Gen we just talked about one here, then there's Genesis 1 verses 4, the separation of light and darkness. But in Revelation 21 verse 25, it says, there's no light, but there's only day. In Revelation 21, well, in Revelation in Genesis first 1 verse 10, it talks about the separation of the land and sea. In Revelation 21, there is no more sea. Genesis 2, a river flows from the garden. In Revelation, a what does it say there? A river flows from God's throne. And in Genesis chapter 2, there is the tree of life in the midst of the garden. And in Revelation 22, there is the tree of life throughout the city. In Genesis chapter 2, there's gold and precious stones in the land. And in Revelation, it speaks of gold and precious stones throughout the city. In Genesis 3.8, as we learned already this morning, God walks in the garden. And he walked there among his creation. And what does it say in Revelation 21? God will dwell amongst his people. Genesis 3.17, the ground is cursed because of man's sin. Revelation 22, there will be no more curse in the new earth. And in Genesis 3, 17 and 19, sin results in pain and death introduced in the new creation. In Revelation 21, there is no more pain or death in the new heavens and the new earth. And in Genesis chapter 3, mankind is banished from the garden and the cherubs guard the entrance. 
And in Revelation 21, 9, angels actively invite into the city. There are some, just some beautiful things that we see in the comparisons between Genesis and Revelation. In Genesis 3.15, we hear the first good news, or what theologians like to call the proto-evangelion. And that's proto meaning first, evangelion being the evangel, the good news. And that's the promise of the Redeemer who will crush the head of the serpent. And Jesus is the one that's promised at that moment in Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> you see, Jesus is the one who is promised. While Adam broke the law given to him that was brought death to this world, Jesus kept the whole law and defeated death. Adam disobeyed and ate of the tree that God told him not to, bringing death. And Jesus obeyed, and he died on a tree, bringing life. As in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, For as in Adam all dies, so also in Christ all will be made alive. And today we're going to be looking at that aspect of that similarity, but we're going to be looking at it through the span of Scripture. And when we look at this through the span of scripture, we're going to be looking at a few points quickly. And I, like I said, our passage for today is Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and morning one day. And then he saw the light and he said it was good. And then, but this to me is just one of the most amazing things when we hear the very first command, the very first statement from the mouth of God, let there be light. And he is light, therefore he can make light, he can command light. And it was understood of this even with the Israelites once they had the tabernacle set up. What was one of the items that they had in the tabernacle? They had the golden lampstand that was made out of pure gold. How many times was that light supposed to be lit? lit? That's kind of a, yeah, once. Now that's kind of a trick question because it was only supposed to be lit once and it was supposed to be kept lit forever. This is a picture, this is an image of God as light for eternity. And and, and it was in an Exodus chapter, we read that in Exodus 25 and in Exodus 27. It was supposed to be lay, stay lit forever. In Psalm 27, David says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? And this is, we're seeing here that God is light. He created light. Psalm 104, verses 1 and 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul. This is one of my favorite verses when I was coming across this. You are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering, covering yourself with light as a cloak, stretching out the heaven like a curtain. He's covering himself with light as with a cloak. I don't, we, don't, we don't have those kind of cloaks in our world, do we? But it's an, I, I love the picture and the imagery that he is covering himself with light. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7. The one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these. Sometimes we have a struggle with that verse because we see this God is the one forming light and creating darkness. But we have to go back to Genesis and before he said, let there be light, what had he done? He already had created the world. And, J and then when we look at the New Testament, James says, every good th thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. And when we see God as the one who is that perfect light, there is nowhere we can hide our sin. There is no shadow where we can hide and, and keep our sin away from God. He points it out and he brings it to our vision. When we look in God's word, when we read his word, 
one with one of the things that this it's a light for our life it's a light into our soul that exposes our deeds that exposes our sins and even as we grow closer to god we would think wow i've got all the sin out of my life well that isn't the way the word of god works in fact the more we dig into the word of god and the, even the more we change and we become closer to him, the more we get into his word, the more we begin to see sin at its depths inside us to our motives and our heart in everything. And we almost see ourselves like Isaiah did when he was in the presence of God in Isaiah chapter six. When he was in the presence of God, he says, woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. He, when he was in the direct presence of God, before that, he probably thought, I'm probably a pretty okay. When he came into the presence of God, when we come into the presence of God, when we read his word, what does it do? But it tells us that we are sinners, that we are sinners by nature, and that we need to be constantly looking for those things and confessing those things to him. Isaiah 45, if, for, actually, but this is who God is. He is the perfect light. Christ also is this true light. And when we find that, we look at in, in Luke chapter 20. In Luke chapter 20 is when uh, Joseph and Mary brought Jesus to the temple. And there Jesus was held in the arms of Simeon. And Simeon says this, he says, For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people. And then what does he call Jesus? He says, A light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. He says, A light of revelation to us, that's us, and a glory of your people Israel. And that is one of the reasons why we see that this light and this glory is together here in this passage. He is a light also to Israel, and he is the glory of those who are his children as well. And then in Matthew chapter 17, when he was on the, um, the Mount of Transfiguration, and he was up there, and he was transfigured right before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And here we see that Christ is that true light. John talks about this, and he talks about it, and he brings it all the way from creation as we're doing today, and he brings it all the way up into his contemporary time. In John chapter 1, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All came, things came into being through him, and that's creation, and that's Christ. Christ was the creation, was the creator, excuse me. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. That's the work of Christ. He was the creator. In him was life. And what does he say next? And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which, coming into the world, enlightens every man. And that's what Christ does. That's what his word does. It enlightens us. And we become that light. And in fact, Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, speaks about this. Philippians chapter 2, it says, <clears throat> Do all things, so I'm starting at verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, Children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. Verse 16, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. 
And that is how God wants us to be. And we're going to be coming to that shortly. But then he says in John chapter 8, well, Jesus is that true light. Then Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. There are so many times when I hear people say, show me in the Bible where it said that Jesus, where he said, I am God. And what we under, have to understand is in the Jewish sense, what they believed and understood when they saw this, when they talked about light. And here is one of the statements where he says, I am the light of the world. He even says it again in John chapter 9, where I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And then in John chapter 12, verse 46, he says, I have as come as a light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. And then the apostle Paul speaks about this as well, about Christ being light. He says, and the gospel as well, and we're going to be coming to that. John, and he says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is what? The image of God. And then in 1 Timothy, Paul again speaks and says, 1 Timothy chapter 6, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Our next point that we're going to be looking at is, without light, we are lost, we are sitting judged and condemned. One of the things we know about light is if we were to just black out all the windows and turn out all the lights or if we were all here at night, if, if the lights go out, we don't jump up and run around that much, do we? No, because we'd be running and bumping into each other and stumbling. A natural reaction for us when we are in darkness is just to sit. And when the lights come on, then we walk in the light. And, and that is one of the things we need to understand about us and, and about who we are before Christ. Isaiah chapter 5, it says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, the people who walk in in, well, and, and then he said, and then chapter 9, he says, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light, and those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Now I want to go back to Isaiah chapter 5. He says, those who substitute, have substitute the darkness for light and the light for darkness, through those who call evil good and good evil. When we get to Revelation, all things will be made right. And that is the beautiful thing. We live in a world right now where we see people calling evil good and good evil, do we not? In the end, all things will be made right. God is going to correct this universe and his light will shine forever. And the people who do walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. But even those people who do walk in darkness, what do they do but stumble? One of the things that we have to remember, when, when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, God's light was not marred. That was not what gave was broken. We became blind. Our eyes became un, un, unable to see. That's really what causes the darkness because we even find that in Isaiah chapter 6. In Isaiah chapter 6, after Isaiah was in the very presence of God Almighty, what does he tell Isaiah to do? And this is probably one of the most interesting passages because sometimes we have to come to our end before we will look to God and before we see him. After Isaiah is in the presence of God, after he sees himself as undone, 
And then one of the angels came to him, and with a burning coal in his hand, he t which he took from the altar, he touched his mouth. And then Isaiah hears the voice of the Lord, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. So he says, Okay, I'm going to be going and preaching the good news of Christ, the good news of the gospel. He says, Go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. And, and it's kind of odd for us to think that God would do this. But again, sometimes we have to come to the end of our rope before we finally come to him. But at the same time, what has he told them to do? Render the hearts of the people insensitive, their ears dull, and their eyes dim. And that is our natural state without Christ. Our eyes are dim. We are blind to the good news of Christ. <clears throat> Jesus then said in John chapter 12, and as I've read this before, I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. And he is that glory. But then he says, um, in Micah chapter 7, verse 8, Without light, we are sitting lost, judged, and condemned. Do not rejoice over me, O my enemy. Though I fall, I will rise. Though I dwell in darkness, the Lord is a light for me. Without Christ, I have no light. Matthew is a re-quoting of that what we heard earlier. It says, the people who were sitting in darkness saw great light. And that was the prophecy coming true in Christ. And those who were sitting in the land in the shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. Paul then speaks about this very same thing. He says, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he tells us, Therefore, do not go passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the things hidden in darkness and disclose the motive of man's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. And what is he saying there? Before him, when God's light shines in our life, he sees our motives. He sees who we are. And then in 2 Corinthians, he says, Do not be bound together with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? Again, without him, we are sitting lost, judged, and condemned. But the light of the gospel converts us and makes us children of light. And that's the beautiful thing. And when we, we see this, again, going back to this passage, it says, in only this time it's not quoted in, in the Gospels. It's quoted by Paul in 2 Corinthians. For God who said, light shall shine in the darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge and the glory of God in the face of Christ. So light is the glory of God that we are speaking of here but it is also that which converts us. Colossians chapter 1 says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. That is a wonderful thing to hear, that we share in an inheritance. This isn't something that we earn. This light that God has shine, shown in our hearts, not something that we we do as wages. The only wages we earn in Scripture is death. The wages of sin, the Bible tells us. But we have an inheritance of light. Second Timothy, Paul again speaks, and he says, But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel through the good news. This is how the light comes into our life by the good news of Jesus Christ. And I think the perfect example of this is Paul the Apostle was he was breathing out um, hatred towards Christians. 
he was on his way to kill more Christians when God got a hold of him. In Acts chapter 26 is this story that he gives us, and he says, and he's speaking to a king, and he's giving his testimony to a king, Paul the Apostle is, and he's saying, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me, and those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. So we have a picture of Jesus here as light. He's speaking and he's saying this. But then he says, but get up and stand on your feet for this purpose. I have appeared to you. And what is he going to be telling him next? It's something probably very interesting. He appeared to him as light. He said, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. And what does he say? For this purpose, I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you've seen, but the things in which I will appear to you. And then he says, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, and then what does he say? To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, and that we may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. And that is the same mission that God has given to us as Christians. We are to proclaim the good news of Christ so that their eyes may be opened and they, they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God. That is what our mission is as God's children. And that is what we are. We are God's children of the light. We are guided by the light and we shine this light. And, and one of the things if we remember, if we are children of the light, we seek light. We seek the truth of God. It's kind of like plants and I'm sure all of us have seen this when as the sun moves across we see actually plants moving and following that the sunlight for thessalonians paul says for you are all sons of light and sons of day we are not of night nor of darkness and peter even says this he says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellences of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Wow. And then that's us for understanding us here in the New Testament days, but even so much, even in, in Exodus, God called the people of Israel to be the same. He says, in Exodus chapter 10, they, verse 23, one of the interesting things is, is when the plagues of Egypt went across the land of Egypt, the whole land of the Egypt was dark except for in one particular places. And what does it say in Exodus chapter 10? He's talking about the people of Egypt. And then he says, they did not see no one, one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the sons of Israel had light in their dwellings. And I think this is sometimes something we, we forget and we skip over in this story is that the sons of Israel all had light in their dwellings. And what a picture of us it was we live in, in this world now. We have light in us. And then in Exodus 13, what did God guide the people of Israel with? A pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to give them light that they may travel by day and by night. Wow, that is a wonderful thing. We are children of the light. We are guided by light in the same way they were. Psalm 36 tells us, for with you is the fountain of light. In your light, we see light. <clears throat> Psalm 56, you have been delivered 
You have delivered my soul from death, indeed my feet from stumbling. Remember, if we stumble around in the dark, so that I may walk before the light, before the Lord, before God in the light of the living. Psalm 89, how blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. O oh Lord, they walk in the light of your countenance. Psalm 118, the Lord is God and he has given us a light. Psalm 119, this is probably the most, one of the famous chapters. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And then in Proverbs, this is the one that I really appreciate because, yes, we are to learn how to live in Christ, but we also get life from, from God's word. But the path of righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter until the full day. You see, our light in our life and is not getting darker, but it's getting brighter. And then as we move to uh, Isaiah 49, he talks about how this light is going to be spread to the nations. He says, in Isaiah 49, he says, Is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the preserved one of, ones of Israel? I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. See, one of the things we have to understand is as God planned what happened at the cross. It wasn't plan B. A lot of people think that, well, Jesus came to be king of Israel, and that at that point in time, he would set up his kingdom, but nope, they rejected him, so he went with plan B for the Gentiles. Not so. He planned it all out from this point in time, from the beginning, that what? That he would be, that we would receive this light of the nations, and that we would receive this salvation. John tells us in 1 John, this is a message which we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And if we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and what that happens next. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. The light cleans. The light heals. And I think that's something for us to understand as we are children of the light and that we walk and that we shine the light. And I think that's important for us to understand that we shine this light as too. We walk in the light. We receive the light. But that we also share this light. We shine this light to the world. Because in in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, he, what does he say? You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but put it on a lampstand and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And in Romans chapter 9, Paul reiterates this very same thing. And he says, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those in darkness. See, he calls his church to be the light of the world. He calls each of us to be his light. We are created in the image of God. We are God's reflectors in a lot of ways. In the same way that the moon reflects the light of the sun. God wants us to be in that same way. The sun doesn't have its own source of light, but it reflects that light. Now, our last point that we're going to be looking at today is the end is near and the darkness is passing away. This is the part that we can rejoice in. In Romans chapter 13, Paul says, The night is almost gone. And the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. John also makes a very similar statement. He says, on the other hand, I'm writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. It's almost as if the darkness, as we share God's 
good news, as we share his glory, as we share this truth throughout the world, his light is going to shine more and more. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. This is um, a picture of where we are. The darkness is passing away. And that's the way it needs to be in our life. The darkness needs to be passing away out of our life as well. And that we let this light shine in us. And then we need to also understand that what happens in Revelation chapter 21, when this is all reversed, when all the curse of, of sin is, is being reversed, instead of struggling to walk in the light, which we do, there is no doubt that we do because John tells us we're going to have struggles. I might not like the people I have to live with around me, but guess what? This is how we see God's light and his love in our life, is by loving those around us. But then in Revelation, in Revelation chapter 21, we see something absolutely fantastic. It's that consummation where all wrongs will be made right, where God's justice will have perfect um, and have a perfect ending to everything. In Revelation chapter 21, and the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illuminated it, and the lamp is a lamb. The nation, the nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it in the day of the in the daytime, for there will be no night there. Its gates will never be closed, and they will bring glory and honor and, and the honor of the nations into it. And see, this is where God dwells, where there will be no night. And this is going to be perfect daylight for all of us. It's going to be that final consummation. And he reiterates this again. In Revelations chapter 22, verse 5. And there will be no longer any night. And they will, have, they will not have need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun. Because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. And that is probably one of the most beautiful things for us to understand. That we will be, as, as we walk in this world, we understand that he created this world, he created light. And then we understand that Christ is that true light that came. And that without Christ, we are lost. We are sitting judged and condemned if we have not given our lives to him. If we have not come to the saving knowledge of Christ. And that light of the gospel does convert us. And it makes us his children, children of the light. And that as children of the light, we are guided by that light. And we shine that light. And we also understand that there is hope. And that hope is sure and that hope is certain. That even though the world that we live in has darkness all around it, we shine that light. But we also understand that there is coming a greater light. And that will one day be the true light, Jesus, when he comes to rule and reign in this world. And that is a day that I am absolutely looking forward to. But none of that could be possible without Christ, the true light, giving his life for us. Of him taking our sin on the cross and putting that light of life within us. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come to you. We admit that we, without you, walk in darkness. We stumble around. And even so, now that we, from time to time, put ourselves willfully into these positions where we're stumbling around in the darkness and we need to be in your word, we look as your word, and we need to be living, as your word tells us, as a lamp for our feet and a light for the path. And Lord, we pray that we would constantly 
be opening your word, letting this light shine in us, pointing out where we need to be guided in our life. And that one day, all of this will have be consummated with you in a kingdom where we will dwell with you forever in a city that has no night. In these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen.